Good afternoon and welcome. I'm John Longston. I am the Interim Dean for the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And I wanted to thank you for taking the time today to come to the annual State of the College address. A couple of announcements. We have a little less time this year than we have in the past. So we're going to make two small adjustments, those being question and answers and the photo ops for the Millionaires Club. We'll do those outside on the plaza when we finish. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. It has been an extraordinary year for us in terms of the pandemic that we have all lived through, as well as the change that we've seen locally and nationally. What I wanted to do though, is to give you a sense of how the college has not only survived, but thrived during this time in terms of our research endeavors, our commitment and excellence to education, our approach to the pandemic, and the success and the national and international recognition that our faculty have enjoyed. So what I wanna do in the time that we have is just give you a taste of what we've accomplished over the past year, as well as some of the things that we have to look forward to. First, we are back in session. And I think by and large, if one were to look out on our campus on any given day, it would look like any other year, which is a tremendous accomplishment. Our infection rates remain low, our students are in session, and in fact, the only classes that are not held online, or the ones that are held online, are those that are not available from Javits. So that's a remarkable accomplishment. To witness, here's a snapshot of the COVID dashboard for the university as of this morning. And you can see that there are eight students in the past two weeks who have tested positive for COVID. Our rates remain low, and as you can see, we're more than halfway through the semester, we are doing well. So this is an extremely positive and encouraging sign. We've also seen significant change. The university welcomed President Mari McInnes last summer, and in fact, her inauguration formally is tomorrow, as well as Provost Goldbart last March. We also saw the departure of the college's dean, Boda Satiropoulos, who went on to become the provost at Virginia Commonwealth University over this past summer. There is a search underway this academic year for a new dean that is expected to be completed in the spring. And I wanted to give you a taste of, first of all, some high level things that have happened that generate excitement. And then we'll talk a little bit more about some specifics for the college. The first is the President's Innovation and Excellence Fund. And this was funded by the Simons Foundation with a base funding of $25 million and then an additional opportunity for a one-for-one -one match. If successful, that will give us a total of $75 million available for the following. The first is to recruit National Academy faculty. And the second is to stimulate research through a couple of different mechanisms. First is seed grants, which historically have shown to be very good investment on returns. We're seeing these actually in a number of other venues on campus. And the second is the Discovery Prize, which historically has run about once every two years. Now it'll run twice a year. So a fourfold increase in frequency of that event. Another emphasis of the Innovation Fund will be expanding our climate solution and leadership endeavors. And to that end, I would draw your attention to another initiative that we just completed. This actually, the proposal formally went in last Wednesday on October 30th for the Governor's Island Initiative. And this is a, an opportunity to transform Governor's Island into a center for climate solution and climate study. And uh, located just south of Manhattan, the idea would be that this would be a central area for climate focus. So Stony Brook put together a proposal on this and in fact, it was made available to the campus. I encourage you to have a look at it. It is a beautiful document. It's 184 pages long and represents some enormously comprehensive and sophisticated thinking. It also raises the bar in terms of what we're able, able and capable to do in terms of our ambition. My impression in seeing that document was the following. The question became, what can we do has now become what can we not do? So I would encourage you to have a look at that. I think that's an exciting and ambitious 
um, opportunity that we've gone after. It would be transformational for the university. And again, just in general represents a new high watermark in terms of what we're capable of doing. Another initiative that took place over the past year, and actually many of you were involved in this, is the Strategic Budget Initiative. This was put in place by the president. And the idea was to look at the university as a whole, holistically, in terms of its efficiency and cost of operation to try to find ways to improve operations. And this was done through five separate task forces. One of those relevant for the college was the Research and Innovation Task Force, which I had the honor to co-chair with a colleague on East Campus. And the idea was to look at ways to improve efficiency of operations, reduce administrative burden, and find ways for our research to be more successful. Phase one ran from October to May of this past year. And we're now implementing phase two. Again, many of you are involved in this. This includes the standing up of tiger teams that represent focused and directed efforts to anticipate specific research areas and then prepare ourselves for those. In other words, rather than a reactive approach in which a proposal opportunity hits the streets, we will take a proactive approach to be more competitive and more successful. Another really significant improvement is the addition of resources to help with the administrative side of putting proposals together, particularly as we go after larger proposals with more institutions, more PIs, there is more complexity, there is far more administrative burden. And so we are putting resources in place to be able to help with that, again, to minimize the friction that an investigator has to go through in order to get proposals out. A little closer to home and something extremely exciting is the prospect for a new engineering building. Now, this is something that's been in the works actually for a number of years. And about two years ago, we received some funding from the state to the tune of about $25 million towards the building. For reference, the building itself would be a 100,000 square foot, $100 million endeavor. For reference, that's the size of CWIT over in the research park to give you a sense of scale. The building, by the way, would go between light engineering and the intersection of Campus Drive and Circle Road there. There's a swath of woods and the building would, would sit there. So it would be centrally located with the rest of our engineering complex. And the building itself would include a wide cross section of opportunities, including teaching labs, uh, classroom spaces, maker spaces, um, faculty research, collaborative areas, and an innovative idea we're calling the Innovation Gateway, which is something we've been working on for a couple of years. But the idea is to integrate entrepreneurship, innovation, the general community, as well as students and faculty to develop and foster a culture of entrepreneurship. And the intent is to locate the Innovation Gateway in the building. Just last Friday, we put a proposal into the state for $50 million as part of a capital matching program. If we are successful, that will get us very close to, if not across the finish line, in order to start building the building. Even if not, the funds that were originally given to us two years ago had been frozen because of COVID, so we could do nothing. Those have now been thawed, and we will begin to be able to do the design of the building, which we will start on imminently. This would be transformational for the college. We also continue to grow and forge into new and exciting areas. And I just wanna give you a taste of the many things that we have in play. The first is computational neuroscience. This is with Petr Jurek and the idea and his colleagues at Stony Brook and some other institutions. The idea is to explore brain activity as well as potentially stimulate it with the idea, the grand goal, of possibly waking up coma patients. We also have efforts in quantum engineering, which is an emerging area. We have several projects now, led by Himanshu Gupta and C.R. Ramakrishnan in computer science. And their focus is on the networking of a variety of different quantum networks. Very hot, very rapidly emerging area. In the energy space, we have a couple of projects. In renewable energy, as you may know, we house the National Offshore Wind Consortium that's funded by DOE. And Ali Kashrenajad from Civil Engineering has a project to optimize 
the location of wind turbines in an offshore format. And then on the electrical power systems side, the grid itself is going to be transformed from a traditional unidirectional source of energy from source to consumer. Now it will be bidirectional, which represents a vastly different paradigm for how the grid will work. Peng Zhang has a convergence accelerator project from NSF that will look at developing AI enabled grids for efficiency and resiliency. So some exciting opportunities as we forge ahead. The other thing that is extraordinarily promising for us, particularly in the College of Engineering is the following. As many of you know, there is legislation that is working its way through Congress. It's called a couple of different things. The Senate version is USICA, the US Innovation and Competition Act. In the House, it is the new National Science Foundation. Both bills are to the tune of about $250 billion. And the idea is to focus on several key thematic areas that are required for America to main, remain competitive. And if you look at these, virtually all of these fall comfortably within our wheelhouse of engineering. If you think of AI, medicine, energy, cybersecurity, and the environment, we touch on all of these topics convincingly. So the next three years to five years is going to be an extraordinary rich opportunity for us to seek resources and proposals and programs and grow and contribute to these vibrant areas. On the education side, we remain committed to our educational program. A snapshot of where we are this fall semester is as follows. We have about 3,700 undergraduate students, 750 master students, and about 700 PhD students. That's all from a high of about 4,000 students that we saw a few years ago. I think uh, a number of folks would argue very quickly though that that was almost uncomfortably large. So we're at a good spot. In many programs, demand exceeds capacity. So the demand for our programs remains high. We also are the number one producer of bachelor's degrees in the state, a distinction we've held for four years. We're the 24, number 24 in terms of bachelor's degrees in the country, 35 in terms of doctoral degrees, and 33 in terms of total degrees overall nationally. The quality of our students is also outstanding. SAT scores typically are above 1400, GPA above 96 percentile. If you look at this chart, which we're fond of showing, it shows our range of SAT scores for our students compared to some of our colleagues. And as you can see, we hold ourselves in very good company. Our students are as good as any in the country. Our graduation rates similarly have increased from about 50% from about five or six years ago to almost 70%. And that's done by a concerted effort that includes comprehensive advising, faculty mentoring, making faculty and students aware of critical deadlines and criteria, and moving in quickly and swiftly to help those students that do find themselves in academic distress. We also continue to embrace and grow our efforts in diversity. The graph here shows the fraction of females in the college by year as a percent of total enrollment. And you can see that we follow the US trend, which is in gray, in fact, we're slightly above it. We saw a bit of a dip with COVID, but then that appears to be rebounding as well. When we look at our underrepresented minority enrollments, they have been flat for the past five years. And this is something that we need to improve. Taking a closer look reveals an interesting trend. It turns out that actually for underrepresented minorities, the applications are up and the admissions are up, but our challenge is in actually getting them to enroll. They are not choosing Stony Brook as their ultimate alma mater. So this is something we need to focus on. One thing that will help in this regard is scholarships in order to help the financial burden of being able for them to join us and be able to do their studies with us. So this will be something that we do moving forward. 
Our Women in Science program also continues to do extremely well. You can see about five years ago, our enrollment was about 250. Now we are well over 400. And enrollment continues to grow both with first year students as well as returning students. Also, our diversity and outreach remains rich and um, diverse in terms of the number of programs we have. And one of the things I, I think that's worth pointing out is that we've actually been doing this for a long time, primarily through the late Dave Ferguson, who was a professor here for many years in the Department of Technology and Society. And he had spearheaded many of these programs from very early on. They continue to main, remain vibrant and successful to this day. Some examples include the STEP program, which targets K-12 students, the C-STEP program, which targets collegiate students, the LSAMP program, which is actually a SUNY wide program for underrepresented minorities, and ASSETS, which is oriented towards transfer students to Stony Brook. But these programs have been in play for a long time. STEP and C-STEP, upwards of 35 years, running continuously, providing support to students. In fact, STEP and C-STEP were recently renewed for a five-year grant cycle at a funding rate of four and a half million dollars. The expected number of students that they will influence is upwards of a few thousand. We also continue to grow and expand our diversity efforts, training, and awareness. Over the past summer, the entire college administration, including the dean, associate dean, and chairs, and the, liaison, the uh, diversity liaisons for each department went through diversity training with Dr. Judy Brown Clark. In addition, our graduate student orientation and TA training have incorporated diversity training into their programs. We've established diversity plans for each department that uh, may also be of use to you because proposals also increasingly are demanding this component of them. So having these up to date and accurate will be of use to you. And we continue our recruitment and outreach efforts as well. A couple of examples, we recently held the American East Conference that was, that was um, co-coordinated with historically black colleges to talk about all aspects of graduate school from application to funding it and what to expect. We also have the Greater New York ACE Mentor Program Collegiate Fair that recently just completed. So in sum, we continue to build a diverse and inclusive environment within the college. Despite the challenges that we have faced over the past year, as I said, we have continued to thrive and grow. And that includes the recognition of our faculty at the national and international level. And I wanted to recognize some of those who have achieved awards. First though, we'll talk a bit about research expenditures. Our research expenditures continue to grow. They are the highest that the college has seen. Uh, we've just a slight improvement since last year, again, factoring COVID underlying all of this. But our expenditures this past year were about $47.2 million and up about 47% or so from five years ago. Research expenditures for faculty similarly have increased significantly. They're up about 46% for the past five years uh, at about $275,000 per faculty. In terms of recognizing some of our faculty's accomplishments, Professor Esther Takeuchi from the Department of Material Science and Chemistry in a joint appointment at Brookhaven was elected to be a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Yishan Chin, the chair of biomedical engineering, was promoted to the rank of distinguished professor, which is the highest professorial rank within the SUNY system. We also have a number of awards and accolades that our faculty have won. And these include the following. Stanley Back from Computer Science received the AFOSR Young Investigator Award. Zhenhua Liu from Applied Math and Science received the Early Career Award from NSF. And Andy Schwartz from Computer Science, the DARPA Young Faculty Award. 
Danny Bluestein from Biomedical Engineering as well won the ASME Savio Wu Translation of Biomechanics Award. Lillianne Mujica Parodi from Biomedical Engineering received the Fulbright Distinguished uh, Chair Award. And Hassan Arbab received the Young Scientist Award from the International Society of Infrared Millimeter and Terahertz Waves. In computer science, Michael Bender was elected a distinguished member of the Association for Computing Machinery. Aruna Balasubramanian received the SIG Mobile Rockstar Award, also from the Association for Computing Machinery. And Scott Schmolka received the Edgar Dijka Prize in Distributed Computing. Kevin McDonald from Computer Science received the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. Eddie Chan in Biomedical Engineering received the SUNY's Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Faculty Service. And Aaron Giuliano from Civil Engineering received the SUNY's Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Professional Service. Also, Jeff Ga from Mechanical Engineering received the ASME Design and Engineering Division Mechanism and Robotics Award. And Yi Shen again won or was elected a fellow of the International Academy of Medical and Biological Engineering. We also recognize excellence in teaching. And this year we have two recipients of the college's Excellence in Teaching Award, including Kadar Karani from Mechanical Engineering for his outstanding efforts in the classroom, as well as Kevin McDonald from Computer Science, who also won the CEAS Excellence in Teaching Award. Finally, we recognize our students who themselves excel, despite having the rigors of an academic full load as students in the college. And two in particular are Danielle Jamal and Adit Anand, and they have achieved a number of leadership and recognition and internship awards in addition to their full-time commitment as a student. We also have two groups from chemical and molecular engineering to undergraduate student groups that developed personal protection equipment during the COVID crisis. And they include Robert Haksari, Yingyi Liang, Maya Florentino, and King Chen Yu on the top. And the second group is Yuta Baba, Rui Chen, Andrew Sutarho, and James Yang on the bottom. On a sadder note, Henry Honigman passed away on October 5th. Henry was with the college for 50 years. He was a master welder, uh, an advisor, an instructor, and a mentor. And many of us knew him and knew him well. He had touched countless students during his half century of service here. Sadly, today would have been his 87th birthday. But Henry's memory lives on both through the faculty, staff, and countless students whose lives he touched, as well as the indelible imprint that he has made on the college as it has grown to what it is today. We also welcome new faculty to the college. These are faces that you will see in the halls and classrooms, including Eric Miller from Applied Math and Statistics, Mari Jack Christick from Civil Engineering, and Supartha Potter, from computer, engine, from computer science. Also, Dominique Kempa from computer science, G. Gal from mechanical engineering, and Amin Fakhari also from mechanical engineering. We welcome two new additions to the leadership team in the college. Wei Zhu from Applied Math joins us as the Associate Dean for International Programs and Faculty Affairs. And Wei Yin joins us from Biomedical Engineering as the Associate Dean for Diversity and Outreach. And we're welcome and delighted to have them join the team. Our philanthropy efforts continue in full swing. We, re we raised just under $6 million last year. As you might imagine, COVID had a debilitating impact in terms of fundraising and philanthropy. But we're beginning to see that rebound now in terms of the, uh, 
how we've done last year compared to the year prior. We also will have a ribbon cutting ceremony for the Spellman High Voltage Laboratory, uh, Power Electronics Laboratory. This is located in electrical engineering. It's a beautiful facility that's been designed and developed for student training. And that will happen in April sometime. You are all welcome. We'll get information out as the date is finalized and the time nears. We also continue to move up in our ranking. Since about 2015, we've moved from 69 to 62 in terms of our US News and World Report rankings. And our peer assessment score has risen from 2.7 to 2.9 and our recruiter score from three to 3.3. Now these are important because these are difficult numbers to move. These are perception metrics rather than quantitative metrics. But the fact that these are rising suggests that our peers and recruiters perceive us in an, improve, an ever improving light. We remain and continue to be committed to becoming a top 50 engineering school. The trend is in the right direction and we will continue to pursue and aspire towards this goal. A bit about the operating budget of the college. This is something that is front and center for many of us, but just to give you a sense of where we are. This is the cost of operating the, the college uh, as a function of year, and you can see it increases slightly. The blue is the base funding that we receive from the state, and the red is the operational costs that we are obligated to provide in order to keep the, the college running. And this has been increasing. It is a concern. Ways in which we generate revenue for the red piece include summer and winter tuition, online courses, and some tuition return. Now the university is revisiting a tuition return revenue model that um, we may be able to reassess this. Uh, the other complication, as you'll see, most of our costs are actually salary. And because we've had to inherit the contractual salary increases that originally had been presented to the state, this is a, a significant issue that we, we have to deal with. And to clarify that a bit, if you break down the cost of operating the college, the vast majority, overwhelming actually, is salaries between faculty, staff, and students. Only 2% is non-salary related costs. So in sum, it's been an extraordinary year. We have faced challenges, we have overcome them. Not only have we survived, we have thrived. As we look forward, there are tremendous opportunities ahead of us, and we will approach them head on, full steam, to grow, survive, survive, and excel. And I look forward to taking that journey together with you. This closes the state of the college presentation. What I would like to do now is turn to the Millionaires Club, which is a, um, a recognition of our faculty who have done exceptionally well in terms of research funding. It's something we've done for a number of years. So requirements for the Millionaires Club are a faculty as a PI to have achieved, to have achieved a million dollars or more of funding in the current annual cycle. So for this year, we have 18 millionaires bringing in a total of $39 million in new grants. And I'd like to recognize each of these. First is Dima Kozakov for his work in simulating multi-proton systems and developing novel chemical probes using a variety of chemical analysis techniques. He is a three-time winner. His work is funded by NIH, uh, through a couple of different projects. Pei Fen Kuang, Pei Fen Kuang, I apologize, Kuang from AMS also is a, for her work in looking at cognitive decline in World Trade Center responders in terms of a longitudinal study, as well as looking at Alzheimer's disease in World Trade Center responders. Her work is funded by the Center for Disease Control and NIH. She is also a three-time Millionaire's Club recipient. Hassan Arbab from BME 
has developed a miniaturized spectrometer to develop burn depth. His work is supported by the US Army Medical Research Group. He is a two-time winner. Gabor Balazi from Biomedical Engineering for his project on the dynamics and evolution of synthetic and natural gene regulatory networks funded by NIH. Gabor is a two-time millionaire winner. Paul Vasca from Biomedical Engineering shares the same project on Alzheimer's disease in World Trade Centers. This is a multi-PI project. Barbara Chapman from Computer Science for her project on open SHMEM of programming models for advanced computing funded through the Department of Energy. Himanshu Gupta has several projects in quantum computing and in secure spectrums for spectrum shared spaces funded by the National Science Foundation and Cisco. Dimitri Samaras has a project on digital pathology and specialist attention funded by the National Science Foundation. Dimitri is a two-time millionaire winner. Andy Schwartz, also from computer science, has two projects, one on quantifying relation in human beliefs using deep learning and natural language processing, and another in advanced language analysis of social media, funded by the US Army and NIH, respectively. Andy is a two-time winner. Erez Zadak, also from computer science, for his work across several projects in terms of storage, reliability, optimization, and validation. His work is funded by the National Science Foundation and Facebook. He is a two-time winner. Matt Eisenman from Electrical and Computer Engineering has a project from the Grantham Foundation on ocean acidification and mitigation of that acidification and developing RF shielded windshield windows using dope graphene. His work is funded by the Grantham Foundation and the Department of Energy. Fang Lu from Electrical and Computer Engineering has a variety of projects on high density, high power electronics that also look at things like cabling losses and thermal management. His work is funded by the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, NASA, and JetCool. Yakov Shamash from Electrical Engineering has a project on Navy, from the Navy in terms of collaboration, in terms of energy resiliency. Peng Zhang, also from Electrical and Computer Engineering, has the NSF Convergence Accelerator to look at AI-enabled grids, we mentioned earlier, as well as uh, quantum analytics using efficient and resilient power systems funded by the Department of Energy. Peng is a two-time awardee winner. Dilip Grisepi from Material Science for his work on biopolymer amended soils funded by the US Army, Department of Defense. Dilip is a two-time winner. Lance Sneed, also from Material Science and Engineering for his work on advanced materials for superconducting tokam tom tokamak reactors also funded by the US Department of Energy. Esther Takeuchi, material science, from her work on electrolytes for lithium ion batteries under extreme conditions. Esther is a three-time Millionaire's Awardee winner. And finally, Venkatesh from material science and engineering for his work on developing damage resistant materials for hydrogen storage and transport and the development of fatigue and wear minimized nanostructure surfaces. His work is funded by the National Science Foundation for both projects. I'd like to congratulate all of this year's Millionaire Club awardees. And just as a sum to see where we've been when we started in 2016, we had 11 awardees at $20 million. You can see we're at 18 now or 30 miles. So, so we continue to expand and grow. And with that, our conversation comes to an end, at least here. 
I'd invite all of you to join us out on the plaza for Q&A and refreshments as well, and to enjoy the rest of the beautiful fall day. Thank you for your time.